So far in this journey, I've completely ignored the vast majority of the English people, the peasants. Throughout these long centuries, they were effectively powerless. England had always been an agrarian nation. Its wealth was in the land. But the peasants whose job it was to extract that wealth were kept themselves in poverty, unable to leave their villages without permission, tied in service to the local lord. They were little better than slaves. What follows is the story of how, in the late 14th century, those peasants rose up against their masters. It's known today as the Peasants' Revolt. This is Cressing Temple in Essex, the county where the Peasants' Revolt began. On the 13th of June, 1381, life on this peaceful manor changed forever. According to ancient sources, on that day, over 100 peasants stormed Cressing Temple. They sacked the manor, they drank the wine cellars dry, they torched the buildings. All that's left from those days are these impressive medieval barns. And the only reason they're still here is that on that fateful day, they happen to be empty. These were tithe barns, where peasants came to pay taxes to the local lord. But in 1381, a new tax had stirred people to anger. A poll tax, and everyone paid the same, which struck people as unfair, because a shilling was nothing to a rich man, but for a laborer, it was two weeks' pay. The Lord of Cressing Temple, Sir Robert Hales, just happened to be the king's royal treasurer, a symbol of this unjust tax. But soon, no lord or nobleman was safe. There were uprisings from Somerset to East Anglia, from Yorkshire to Kent. Pretty soon, this was more than a rebellion about tax. In Maidstone, in Kent, the peasants sprung from prison a rabble-rousing priest called John Ball. He had been thrown out of the church for spreading all sorts of dangerous ideas. He asked, why were some people poor and others rich? Why did some people work the land and others own the land? Why should the poor obey the law when they had no say in the making of those laws? And it's exciting, because what we're reading for the very first time in the pages of English history is a call for what today we'd call democracy. Why, in the late 14th century, did the peasants for the first time question their own powerlessness? The answer's simple. From 1350, a dreadful plague had swept the nation. Half the population had lost their lives, rich and poor alike. It seemed like a sign from God. We're all equal in the face of death. But also, with the population halved, there were fewer peasants to work the rich men's lands, which meant those that survived could demand a better wage. So now the peasants were calling the shots. And when the powers that be stung them with an unjust tax, they weren't taking it. The peasants from Cressing Temple joined a rebel army marching on London. 50,000 strong, they camped south of the River Thames, and there they waited for the king to respond to their demands. The king at the time, Richard II, was just a boy. He was only 14 years old, and he was holed up there in the tower, which back then was a royal palace as well as a prison. And he decided he had no choice but to confront the rebels, to go to Blackheath to see what they wanted. And so he took the royal barge, and he headed down river towards the peasant camp. The peasants made it clear that it wasn't the king who was the problem. Their beef was with his advisers, men like Sir Robert Hales. But even so, the boy king showed courage. The sight that met their eyes when they reached the peasant camp was scary, to say the least. There were rebels 
filling the shoreline. And from the barge, they could hear the anger in their voices as they called out for the arrest of the king's advisers. And so they chose not to land the barge. They turned, they went back up river, and the rebels were further infuriated by what they took as a royal snub. What happened next was chaos. The rebels swarmed west. They crossed London Bridge and fell on the city of London. Prisons were thrown open, legal records were burnt. The skyline of London was red with flames. The tower was meant to be impregnable, but they broke in. Richard wasn't there, but Sir Robert Hales was, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, a man called Sudbury. And they dragged them out, and the crowd executed them both. Apparently, they weren't very good at it. It took eight blows of the ax to chop off Sudbury's head. And then they took the heads, and they stuck them on spikes, and displayed them on London Bridge, the traditional fate of traitors. Richard's whole kingdom was in rebellion. Half his troop of royal bodyguards had deserted him. And yet, once again, he set out to face the rebels. The final confrontation took place at Smithfield, on the site of the modern meat market. What happened? And it's confusing. There are at least four different versions of this story. But it seems that Wat Tyler, who was the peasant's leader, dismounted. And he came over to the king's horse and he took his bridle. And he spoke to the king with a complete lack of respect. And he laid out the peasant's demands. What he wanted, he said, was a new Magna Carta, declaring that all men under the king were equal. And what Richard did, and this was extraordinarily brilliant, was he simply agreed with Tyler. He took the wind out of Tyler's sails. He diffused the crowd's anger. And Tyler went back to his horse. And there was a pregnant pause, and no one quite knew what was going to happen next. But then one of the king's men threw out an insult, and Tyler spun back round, and there was a scuffle, there was a fight, and the knife went in. And that was when it could have turned ugly. The crowd might have butchered the king, butchered the king's men. Instead, Richard reclaimed his authority. He seized the moment. He rode over to the crowd and he said, you shall have no other captain but me. And that was it. The crowd broke up. The crisis was over. Of course, Richard never did keep his promises. There was to be no Magna Carta for the common people. Instead, he gave orders that the leaders of the rebellion should be caught and strung up on gibbets. Why remember a failed revolt? Because in the language of men like John Ball, you glimpse for the first time a dream of democracy, of equality. For that dream to become a reality would take another 500 years.